Pet Stacker coming to you with another discussion topic video and in this video we are going to take a look at um, an article that I found over on the Perthman's website so if you go over to their website you know obviously they have a lot of information about upcoming releases and you can shop there and they have other information but if you look under the invest tab um, there's a part that says news and reports and uh, if you click on that it'll take you over to um, another page which has um, you know a lot of different um, articles um, that are related to precious metals and bullion so global bullion news opinion pieces Perth Mint Bullion News and Research and Analysis. I like to check Research and Analysis tabs. And I read an article which comes from over from Kitco, and it says, what kind of a gold investor are you? Now, if you're not familiar with Kitco, if you just go over to their website, kitco.com, um, basically it's a multinational um, metals corporation. Um, they have offices in Canada, U.S., Hong Kong, and they offer a range of services. Um, they sell precious metals. They offer storage solutions. They have consulting, and they have a big um, media um, arm as well. So they do a lot of interviews with people in the industries, mining companies, and you know they go to these conferences and talk to all kinds of people. And um, so I have no relation to Kitco, by the way. Just um, you know, I. I have seen a lot of their content and stuff like this and find it to be pretty informative. So, um, so I just want to uh, go through this article, um, which is linked through the Perth Mint's website, um, and, uh, but it's from Kitco, and it's called, uh, What Kind of Gold Investor Are You? And um, it was written by a journalist uh, named Anna Golubova, and uh, it was written on Monday, December 9th, 2019. Um, so let's just go ahead and go through this article. I'm just going to read through it and then uh, go ahead and share some of my um, takeaways and thoughts from this article, okay? So uh, here we go. Um, a growing number of investors are joining the market from a speculative side, choosing the precious metal as a financial asset, which is making gold prices more volatile, according to AVN AMRO. Uh, there are many kinds of gold investors out there, ranging from those who prefer to hold the physical metal to those who choose ETFs or other gold-backed products. And uh, demand for gold as a safe haven has decreased, while demand for gold as a risky investment has increased, said ABN AMRO senior FX and precious metal strategist Georgette Bowl. Um, I believe that's how you pronounce her last name. Um, if gold were nothing other than a safe haven, its, quote, behavior would have been different from what we have seen in recent years. Investors' goals also vary depending on what kind of gold asset they end up choosing, Bull noted. Some investors buy gold as the ultimate safe haven. They purchase gold and keep this in a safe uh, other investors invest in gold products that are backed by physical gold, she wrote. Still other investors speculate on fluctuations in the gold price. These products, however, are not always backed by physical gold. Examples are gold accounts and exchange-traded or synthetic products without physical gold backing. The rise in more speculative gold buying has resulted in more volatile prices, the Dutch bank pointed out. All in all, Speculative demand for gold has made the gold price more volatile. In addition, gold is behaving less as a safe haven. When there is zero trust in the financial system, the only safe option for investors is still physical gold, Bull said. The more speculative side treats gold as a financial asset, which can act as an anti-dollar investment choice, the strategist added. In a world with two gold prices, the price of physical gold will predominantly behave as a safe haven. The other gold price, by contrast, will act more like a financial asset and can serve as an anti-dollar investment, Bull explained. Speculators are the ones responsible for day-to-day -day price fluctuations, she added. Investors who purchase gold as a safe haven tend to be patient investors, happy to take short-term price fluctuations in their stride. 
But there are also many investors who want to earn money on the short-term movement of the gold price. They are chiefly responsible for the day-to-day -day swings in the gold price, Bull stated. On the other hand, investors who hold physical metal don't usually sell. Many of them were not even willing to let go of their gold holdings during the 2008 financial crisis, said Bull. Who exactly were those investors that decided to sell their gold at that time? Were they the ones who were holding physical gold in a safe, or were they the short-term speculators in gold? The first group would think three times before parting ways with their gold. And though the system appeared to be on the verge of collapse, it had not yet actually done so. The main panic occurred among speculators who urgently needed to trade in their gold investments for ready cash, she wrote. Last week, the Dutch bank released a bullish outlook on gold in 2020, saying that prices will rise to 1600 by year-end. Monetary policy and lower real interest rates will be the top drivers for gold in the second half of 2020. Central banks remain keen to support growth and or to reach their inflation target. In the near term, we expect growth in the eurozone to remain weak and the economic situation in the U.S. to deteriorate, Bowl said. The outstanding amount of negative yielding government bonds will probably grow. While gold has no yield, it is at least not paying negative rates. True that. All right, so i um, just going to go ahead and um, you know offer some of my thoughts and takeaways on this article. It's a pretty interesting article. There's a lot of different um, things to think about that are discussed here. So, um, number one, uh, you know, the first thing I kind of think of, the first thing I want to say is that, you know, a lot of stackers say something like, if you don't hold it, you don't own it, right? And what they're talking about is the difference between owning physical gold, as is mentioned in the article, versus paper gold, and whether that paper gold is supposedly backed by physical gold or not doesn't really matter to people in the stacking community. They think if you don't have it, then you don't really own it, which I tend to agree with. Um, but it doesn't mean that we in the stacking community who prefer to hold physical gold should dismiss people who trade gold-backed instruments or paper gold, um, you know, like the gold-backed SPDR ETF. You know, it's it's one of the largest ETFs in the world, and it literally has been the largest um, on a number of occasions in the recent past. And you know, even Wall Street titans, you know, like Ray Dalio and and some others, have sizable amounts of their portfolio dedicated to gold-related stocks, ETFs, futures, etc. And you know, ETFs are really really popular option for investor these days. So. Why do I say that, you know, stackers who demand physical bullion shouldn't ignore so-called paper traders of gold? I mean, the reason is given in this article, you know, it's because the paper traders are in, you know, they're, they're trying to make a profit, you know, day to day, and they're responsible for the day to day fluctuations. So they have a huge impact on precious metals markets, you know, depending on what they say, they think, and they do the um, spot price can fluctuate a lot because of their behavior. So I think that's the point, you know, one of the points uh, in this article is to say that, you know, gold has become more volatile than in the past because there's so many paper traders. So for me, takeaway number one here is to stay up to date with and be informed about the entire gold market, you know, not just the specific segment of the gold market um, and the investing that I'm participating in you know, which is the physical segment. But I got to be aware of everybody who's playing in this game, you know. So that's kind of takeaway number one for me. You know, even though I might not agree with whatever the paper traders are doing, and I don't prefer to do that myself, I still need to pay attention and stay up to date about you know, what they're doing and saying and whatnot. So um, number two, I hear a lot of people with, you know, a variety of different perspectives, some within our own stacking community and some skeptics of gold saying that, you know, gold isn't really a safe haven asset. Um, and, you know, I kind of saw that here in this article. And a lot of them often point to the 2008 financial crisis and cite that. And they say that, you know, the gold spot price dropped down with everything else. So it wasn't really a 
you know, safe haven. But if you actually look at what happened, you know, I'm looking at this gold chart right here. In the beginning, in February of 2008, gold was at around $980. And at its lowest point um, in 2008, you know, probably around September, October, it dropped down to about 680 or so. Um, so, you know, I mean, uh, 300 or so, $300 or so drop-off. That's actually not that big. There have been much bigger drop-offs, you know. Um, but... Um, you know, people often point to this and say, oh, see, gold dropped down just like everything else. So it's not really a safe haven asset. And I feel like they kind of did that as well in this article. Um, but there's a, there's a bit of an issue I have with that. Um, I haven't really heard anybody, you know, bring this up, but okay. So my point is, while it's true that gold isn't 100% immune to and completely separate from shocks and conditions in overall you know, economic um, conditions and markets, that doesn't mean that gold isn't a safe haven, okay? There are many people who lost everything in the 2000 financial aid crash, all right? There's, there's a very interesting YouTube channel called Invisible People, which documents the lives of homeless people. And one of the videos uh, in there, it's about a guy who's in Oakland and has set up a tent community. Um, one, of, one, of the, one of the people that documented on that channel, um, he uh, is a man who was a multimillionaire before, but he lost everything in the financial crash. So um, I would encourage you to go watch the video, which I'll leave a link to in the description. But basically, he mentions that he had most of his wealth invested in some of these big banks, which went belly up in 2008, right? And he lost everything. Um, and he said that he had uh, a few million in the bank. He had two homes and a few cars and some boats and stuff. And he tells his whole story. So you can go over there and check it out. But basically, um, we can assume that this guy had a net worth of at least between like three and 10 million. And let's just say for the sake of this example that he had like three million. Okay. And Let's also say that instead of having all his money tied up in these hedge funds, that he also had 20% of it allocated to physical precious metals. Okay, that would be around uh, $600,000 worth, right? And would that have been enough to prevent this guy from going homeless? I mean, it's possible. I'm not sure, but I am sure that it would have been a lot safer if he had some, you know, significant percentage of his portfolio dedicated to physical bullion which he could have fallen back on when times got tough maybe he would have lost you know both of his really nice houses and had to move into a smaller house or something like that but he still you know maybe could have ended up not going homeless if he had some physical bullion um, that he could have used to shield himself and protect himself instead of having all of his you know uh, wealth put away in these hedge funds and by the way i'm not judging this guy or anything like that i think it's really terrible that that people lost everything in that crash um but i'm just saying that physical stores of wealth are absolutely a safe haven asset and just because you know they 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 drop down in price um along with everything else and in in, when there was a financial crash doesn't mean that they're not a safe haven asset um you know it's it is a safety net you know it, it's not ever going to be worth nothing like you know your hedge fund and you know these other accounts which are you know could be actively managed by someone else or or passively managed by an algorithm or something like that you you could lose everything there you're not going to lose everything when it comes to gold and that's why i think it's a safe haven so you know um i don't know there are a lot of talking heads and people on TV, um, but no, none of them um, can tell me anything different and say that gold is not a safe haven asset. It is, and it has been across millennia, across different, um, you know, different uh, societies, different cultures throughout different periods of history. You know, ancient Chinese, Egyptians, Romans, all these different civilizations that had nothing to do with each other, but somehow they all know that gold and silver and precious metals are real wealth, real money, and it still is today, and it can save you when, you know, 
when there's a, a serious financial crash or things get get seriously, you know, uh, economic depressions and, and crash and things like this. So um, I'm not a big believer in like SHTF situations or scenarios or anything like that. Um, and you would need a lot more than just precious metals to save you in a situation like that. But um, anyway, uh, takeaway number two is that, um, you know, I'm sure that, that gold is a safe haven asset and even though a lot of people may be treating it like a speculative investment these days i'm not okay i'm still sticking with um it and knowing that it's a uh, safe haven asset so and takeaway number three is the importance of having a comprehensive investment strategy and fundamental principles that i believe in and live by and you know the speculative traders i feel like a lot of them don't have that even when it comes to investing in companies, they don't know anything about the companies. They just see numbers on the screen. They just want to, you know, look at everything as a way to make a quick buck. And you know what? If that's the path that they choose, then no disrespect to them. But I don't look at things that way. I don't see something as powerful, timeless, and unique, such as gold and silver, which, as I said, has transcended times civilizations uh, shipwrecks and everything and is still looked at as you know one of the basic most fundamental reliable safe assets that you can go with as a way to make a quick buck um, I don't look at it the same way I don't look at precious metals the same way that I look at stocks or bonds or derivatives or futures or any anything else even, I don't even look at precious metals the same way I view other commodities all right I have my own personal financial strategy and I live my life by that and I can make adjustments as needed but this article is basically asking what your strategy is and I like that question because it forces me to think critically about myself my circumstances my environment my surroundings my constraints my potential and other things that are just outside of my control, you know, um, like fluctuations in the market, cycles, crashes, you know, bubbles, booms, busts, you know, I have to accept these things and learn to live with them. And, you know, my strategy and my philosophy, you know, I think is really a strong one and is capable of, of coping with those things. So. Again, it's not just the gold market, which has been more volatile. All the economic markets have recently, and gold isn't separate or immune from that. And, you know, gold is unique, and it has its place, and I know where that place is for me. And I don't have all the answers, but with my strategy and my principles, I feel comfortable enough to adapt as needed, you know. And I think you should ask yourself that question. Do you? What kind of gold stacker are you? You know, what is your gold strategy? Do you feel comfortable enough to adapt um, when things that are outside of your control come your way? You know, because I think that, you know, this article raises some interesting points and looks at things from different perspectives. And that's kind of my final takeaway, you know, which is to have your own perspective, your own principles and your own strategy when it comes to precious metals, you know. You can let the outside information, you know, inform your thinking, but don't let it lead your thinking or cloud your judgment or any of that stuff, you know. Learn what place that stacking precious metals has in your life, okay? And realize that this world is much bigger than you, all right? Now, before I finish up here, there's two channels I want to shout out. One, Silver Bridges. You know, uh, this guy made an awesome video, which is great for you to think critically about your stacking strategy. Um, I'm a big fan of his, and uh, I'll leave a link in the description to the video I'm talking about. Um, so go check it out. And also, Yankee Stacking made a video about his biggest prepping role model. Now, I'm not a prepper, but his video exemplifies what I'm talking about when, you know, in terms of having you know guiding principles and philosophies and i don't necessarily um you know sh share the exact same principles or philosophies as him but i can learn from his principles and appreciate that he and silver branches have 
principles and philosophies and strategies and discipline to stick to those things. So, yeah, that's it, guys. Let me know your thoughts on the article. Let me know your thoughts on my takeaways um, and Silver Bridges and Yankee Stackings video. And, uh, you know, if you go over there and check them out, let them know in the comment section that I sent you over there. All right. Uh, looking forward to hearing everyone's thoughts. And this is Expat Stacker. And I'll catch you on the flip side.